Good morning, Vertical Church. I feel like dancing. Uh, you know, I just had to behave myself because if I get any more sweaty, I might not even be allowed up on the stage. My name is Pastor Randall. It's so good to see all of you here today, and it's going to be an amazing day. Wasn't that great um, to worship this morning? Just sing together, shout a little. We're so blessed. I love this church. I love that I get to do life with all you beautifully broken, perfectly imperfect, Jesus-loving fools. I love that every week, both online and in this place, new people come in who are seeking God. And, and we, don't, we, don't, we don't argue over uh, culture or race or denominational issues or disagreements or anything that. We, we lay that stuff down and we lift up kingdom in this place. I love the fact that we have a senior pastor and, and Ken and Kathy Vance who are some of the most amazing people that I've ever had the opportunity to meet and that they, they have such a strong, powerful vision for this church. Guys, just look around. We are, this is a beautiful place. Beautiful place. Hey, listen, I'm going to pray. I'm super excited this morning and I got to behave myself, so I'm going to just connect to the Father for a second. <laughs> Father God, I thank you so much for this morning, for this beautiful day that we were privileged enough to wake up this morning and breathe another lungful of your beautifulness, Father God. I thank you that you would consider me, Father God, to be able to stand here and share my life and share your word with all who came today. Father, I pray that you would use it, that the lights on this platform that wouldn't reflect me, but, but more the people would see you. Jesus, we love you, we thank you, and we invite you, Holy Spirit, to do all you can do, only what you can do in the hearts of men and women. In your precious name I pray, amen. amen. Look, I'm sorry if I'm a little wound out, but like Pastor Marcus, I feel the presence of God in this place, and, and I know when, when, when he's with us, he speaks to the heart of who we are and, and to the places where we need to hear him the most, and I believe that this is a season of the miraculous, that God is, is blowing in a fresh wind, um, not only uh, you know, in Connecticut, but throughout his kingdom, and that excites me. It excites me. And we need to get excited about what our church is and what we get to experience, and the fact that we get to experience God together. Listen, I just wanna share a couple things. You know, I'm, I serve as a youth pastor, um, as well, and I, and, I, and I get to hang out with your amazing kids, but just celebrate this. This is the kind of stuff that's happening in this church, and maybe you don't know about. But over the past couple weeks, we've had groups of students, we call e-groups, evangelism groups, going out with leaders, and, and just over the past few weeks, we've had 100 people prayed for out in the streets. We've had over 120 people fed and given water, and they're going out into to the New Haven Green and to, 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 to shelters and out to the beach and, and just sharing the love of Jesus with people. In the past few weeks, we've had 11 young students come to Jesus Christ, born again in Jesus Christ. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? And, and, and we've seen 15 of them baptized in just the last few weeks, 15. And what we're getting ready for, they just talked about in the announcements, we're, we're heading in, in a week and a half or two weeks, something like that. We're going to start boot camp, which is a, is a camp where we have over 70 people who are going to be training to be missionaries to go take the love of Jesus Christ all over the world. These are students who are giving up their summer, who raise money to go love people in Harlem, New York City, in Belize, up in the mountains, <laughs> digging holes and, and mixing cement with their hands. And, and right here in our own community, investing into over 400 some kids to kind of come upon this church for VBS. That is exciting. That's exciting, guys. God is moving in a new way. What we know is that one word from Jesus, one word and it changes everything. One word and it changes everything. Let's take a look at Hebrews, this first scripture here. It's 11.3. Uh, it's by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible but by the spoken word of God. The first little bullet point there is the words are the currency of heaven. 
Words clearly are the currency of heaven to bring substance to the earth. When God speaks, he speaks in the language of solution. The first time we see him speak, he's speaking a solution to the situation where earth is without, without. it's formless and void. The Spirit of God is hovering over the darkness and the word is spoken by the Father and the Spirit goes into, in, in, into action and he says, let there be light. And he didn't have to say, let there be a planet that explodes upon itself in a nuclear reaction of helium and, 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 and heat and, and gas and, and, and light. But he said, let there be light and everything that needed to make light just showed up because God spoke it. God spoke it. I love the fact that some of the other things he spoke were you and I. I'm going to take a look at Isaiah 55, 11. It says, so my word that goes out from my mouth will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God speaks in solution. So God looked over the earth. And he, and he said, I, I need something in West Haven, Connecticut. I need somebody in Connecticut. And, and, he, and he spoke out Pastor Ken's name. Pastor Ken's not here, so you can't accuse me of kissing his behind. <laughs> I just love the man. But he, he, he thought of Pastor Ken, and he said, I'm going to put you in this place for 30 years. And for such a time as this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let everything align where the vision and my word and all these things coming together are going to explode into a place called Vertical Church where there's not going to be cultural divides or racial divides, but you're going to lift me up in that place. And guys, you need to know that we are in the healthiest place we've ever been as a church. More people coming, more people staying. <laughs> more, well, our finances are healthy. Praise God. Listen, people are getting healed in this place. People are coming to Christ in this place every week. We have new guests. We're, we're on the edge of the destiny that God spoke through that man's life. And we get to be partakers of that thing. Now, some of us might think that we kind of snuck into existence. Like just kind of like, boop, you know, he didn't see me, right? Just sneaking up into, the, up into creation. But that isn't how it happens. None of you are an accident. You are not an accident. You were spoken into existence. Listen to me. And spoken into existence not by some cold, authoritative, whatever, voice that says, Tom, Samantha. But more of a lover's call from a creator who loves you so intimately and knows you so deeply that he counts the number of hairs on your head and knows what makes you happy and sad and knows your deepest, darkest secrets and struggles and worries and also knows the destiny that he breathed into you that you have yet to realize. That is the God who calls your name. Each of you here on purpose, each of you not in this sanctuary by accident today, but ordained by a word that was spoken about you from your creator. Love it. Love it. And now Hebrews, let's take another look at a, a scripture in Hebrews 12. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, the, the author and finisher of our faith. And how many of you know an author is very... Well, he's a master of words, master of language. He picks his words very carefully. And when God considered you and spoke you before your parents ever thought of you, he, he spoke you on purpose, strategically, with destiny in mind, with power in mind, with passion in mind, with victory in mind. And, and, and we got to get this picture of a God who loves us that deeply, who speaks things into existence and speaks a destiny for us. And as an author, he gives us this ridiculous opportunity. It's really kind of, it doesn't make sense in my mind. If I was going to manage a, something, it would make me crazy to give everybody else, you know, I, I write this perfect book, right? And I want, but you co-author it. Go ahead. 
pick up your pen. Write your story. And pray that, 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 you, that the other person that you gave the pen to has the, has the ability to see where you're headed. Believes enough in what you've said and, 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 and told throughout your word that, that, that I need to follow this thing and I need to be obedient and walk in what God has empowered me in. But sometimes we miss it. So we need to choose our words carefully. We need to be careful what is spoken because we are dominion takers. We are conquerors. We are victorious in Christ. See, the world reads your story, but heaven already knows how it ends. Mm. So we need to cling to the power and authority of the world that spoke you into existence. Now, um, I'm going to skip number three. And I know this is going to drive some of you nuts. But this, we'll talk about three later. Go to four, okay, on your little thing there. The currency of the miraculous is on the tip of your tongue. I mean, if you really want to see miracles, use the power of your words. Lined up with the word of God so that you can begin to see what God spoke for you coming to pass. I'm going to say that again because you guys need to understand that you're giving permission. I, I saw a video, Pastor Rick, who I love. This guy's awesome. What an amazing person to have on the team. But um, he, as, as well as Ken and Kathy, are on vacation this week, a much-deserved rest. They're not together. It's not weird. Um, <laughs> And they left me in charge, which is weird. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but there's a video uh, Rick showed me of his daughter um, receiving the keys to a truck that she had been saving for for a long time. Um, and, and, you know, he, she was away on a trip, and he put some money and bought this beautiful truck, not anything that she would hope for, although, you know, she was hoping for, like, a little thing that maybe could get her back and forth, but this is a beautiful truck. So he hands her the key, and the video, and she looks at the key, and her hand is like, you know, like jello. And she looks, and she walks over this truck, and is this mine? Is it mine? Is this mine? And she's dancing back and forth and screaming, and, and is ridiculously, almost like grossly adorable um, in her excitement and her joy of receiving this amazing gift. Like, she couldn't believe it. And I never want to get to the point in my walk with Jesus where this, this amazing gift of the gospel, of the, of, of the fact that I have words in me that I can speak in miracles. I never want to get to the point where I'm not excited, where I don't jump up and say, you mean me? <laughs> this is me? God, you want to use me? I, I, I want us to not fall into the place of being in religion where when I say that Jesus laid his life down for you, you don't, you don't get just, just something inside of you screaming to say, I want more of you, God. But sometimes in church and religion, we can hear stuff that is so amazing so often that we allow it to deaden what is going on. And words, guys, words spoken can change everything. Can change everything. So when I tell you that the, the miraculous for your life is on the tip of your tongue, I mean, I, I, I believe that God is moving in this place. And I believe if you want to see miracles, you speak what he spoke according to his word, with his word, and things are going to break free. All right? I'm saying, like, the breakthrough of, of, of your marriage is on the tip of your tongue. I'm saying the relationship that you want with your children is on the tip of your tongue. I'm saying that that job... The solution, the finances there on the tip of your tongue. If we agree with God's word and trust them in the middle of his promise and dance with them, like Pastor Mark has said, in the middle of the promise. And we, 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 we agree with his word, exercising our words and our faith in action. Boy, I'm telling you, you're going to see miracles in your life. I mean, we're going to reclaim the kingdom here in, Ver in Vertical Church in West Haven and in Connecticut as it is in heaven. I mean, we're going to see miracles happen in people's lives, and it's not explainable, but we're going to see things showing up because they're agreeing with the word of God. And if we have faith, can we not rely on him to do what he said he was going to do? Now, I'm going to have you guys turn to uh, John 11 if you have your Bibles. If not, we have this amazing screen up here that you can follow along. 
And this is for those here today that have seen their story interrupted. The enemy might be fighting you very, very hard. And you had a dream or a breakthrough that you've been looking for. Maybe something that's died in your life. And you've long since buried it, and you need God to raise that thing up out of the tomb. If you need a resurrection of hope or joy today, this is for you. Because what God said about you will not return to heaven void. It will fill the purpose for which it was sent. So everybody just say, don't stop believing. believing. Now listen, I told you I was a youth pastor. And when they respond better than y'all do, that's a sad state of affairs. I'm going to ask you one more time. You better just misbehave a little bit. I mean, I need you to get a little bit rowdy. All right? I'm not your traditional, you know, white-collar pastor up here, man. I like to have a little fun. You can't get me in trouble. If I'm having fun all by myself, I look like a weirdo. I need you guys to get a little loose, all right? So say it. Say it. Ready? Don't stop believing. Don't stop believing. You boy. Huh? Marcus, you saw that, did that, right? That was a good response. Okay, we're going to read uh, John 11. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one that you love is, is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. This sickness will not end in death. No, it's going to be for God's glory. Right? Amen. And this kind of messes me up a little bit, this next little bit, because Jesus was, um, you know, they, they said, your friend, the one you love, He's sick real bad. He's sick. So sick, matter of fact, we sent people for for a couple days walk to come and get you, Jesus, because you need to come back. And and I I get this picture of Jesus, and I know it's probably not theologically correct, um, but I like to think out on the edge a little bit. Where, you know, if I'm a friend with Jesus, like Jesus is my boy, right? Like, I'm not waiting in line at the club. Yo, Jesus! Yo, part the line. You know, we're coming through. We're coming through. Jesus, my boy right here. Yo, don't make him heal somebody right up, in, right? He nasty. He's going, oh, come on, Jesus, right? And you know Jesus was a good dancer. You just know he was a good dancer. That has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But I just got a vision. Jesus like, yeah, pua. No. Uh, the, uh, I don't know what that even means. Is that dangerous? Is that bad? Uh, I work with kids. Forgive me, oh Lord. (laughs) You know, I was, we were at a a graduation, the 120th graduation I've gone to this uh, over the last 24 hours, it feels. And it was hot. I was, I was like sweating. um, And there there was a pool, but we didn't go in it. And I felt like if you were Jesus, if you were Jesus, Jesus was your friend and you guys were chilling like God in a bod was hanging with you, right? You could just walk out on the water. You don't even get wet, you know. Bring it up, wet it, cool it, come on, out in the water. You don't have to get your hair all messed up, just cool it off, right? Jesus is his friend. He's not his disciple. He's not one of the guys that's carrying his luggage. He is his friend. The one you love. And it messes me up because when we read this, the next verse says, now Jesus loved Mary and her sister and Lazarus. He loved them. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. That's messed up. I, be, I mean, I have a couple friends sitting out there. If I call, you better show up. I know if my wife called and you were the source of her trouble, you better leave because I'm coming and it's going to get ugly. If my friend calls, I'm leaving. And I'm going to, you know, you guys, she, they sent messengers. So Jesus is talking this, the, and lust, the, and, you know, and the officials on love. You know, his Norwegian uh, self in movies with an English accent. Jesus is, they weave Jack Jesus up in the movies. <laughs> but he sounds so elegant as he speaks, right? And, 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 and he's talking, he's teaching, he's laying down some stuff. And, and the guys come up and say, yo, Jesus, your friend, he's sick, man. He's real bad. Who? Lazarus, he's sick. 
Oh, man. Oh, man, well, what's going on? Mary and, and, and Martha, they sent us to get you because they know, look, he's, it's, not, it's looking real bad. And he says, this shall not end in death, but for the glory of God be. And they're like, so you coming? <laughs> right, that was pretty. <laughs> but this is your friend, Jesus. And he turns his back and starts teaching again. And they're like, really, did this happen? Oh, I, I think he wants us to go. Like, what's going on here, right? And this is the Jesus that we just got done. You are holy, right? Jesus is a friend of mine. No. I, he's hanging out for another couple days. He said, don't worry. He'll, it won't end in death, right? Go on your way. It's not going to end in death. So they're like, okay, I guess. We'll just kind of keep going then. Let's read the next couple scriptures here. And he said to the disciples, let us go back to Judea. Okay, this is after. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? Like, you got to take this into consideration because, yeah, it's a dangerous place. And these messengers in their mind are thinking, yo, man, he's punking out. Oh, he'll be okay. It's for my glory. <laughs> okay. Right? He's punking out, but he's just afraid. Because they know he comes back, they're not going to miss him twice. They're going to get him. So they're walking back discouraged. They're walking back empty. They're walking back like, man, what the heck is going on here? And, and, and how many of you know, it's easy to worship in the middle of your promise uh, uh, no, I shouldn't say that. I, I, I messed that up. It's, it's actually easy to worship when you get a word from God. And it's easy to worship when that word comes true, right? But in the middle, when, when, when my brother's dead, or my brother's really sick, God, and you're not showing up, is it easy to worship in the middle of that thing? And some of you, you know, come to church and and you're worshiping God, I'm not feeling good today, but I got my hand, I'm going to worship you today. And then the next day, it's a little bit harder, and you're coughing a little bit deeper, and you're going to worship God. But, and you keep going and keep going until you can't raise your hands anymore. But you know the character of God, that he deserves worship, regardless of the outcome. And you're believing that his word that he sent is true, and it's going to fulfill those things that you're hoping and wishing for. But it's not easy to, middle, to worship in the middle of the promise. It's in the distance between what he said and it actually showing up. Can you worship in that place? But Jesus, you didn't come. Lazarus is sick. He's sick. I mean, he's, he's so sick that we sent friends to come get you. I mean, next scripture. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Any who walks in the day will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. He's talking in riddles. He's talking about, you have me now, and I am the light of the world, and nothing's going to happen unless I say it's going to happen. There will be a time that you're going to walk, want to walk away from me, but you're going to do that out of your own authority, and you're going to stumble in the darkness, right? For they will have no light. Next scripture. After he said this, he went to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And they're like, "Woo! I guess we're going to be good. It's going to be a party. Martha can cook. She got some great back baked macaroni and cheese, right? They're going to be so happy because he's going to be like sleeping on sick. And, and, and we're going to go, well, surprise, right? And Jesus, and we're all going to be there. And it's going to be this great celebration because Jesus said it wasn't going to end in death. Right? So they're psyched. They're ready to go. And then we take a look at this next verse. The disciples replied, look, if he sleeps, will he get better there? Yeah, okay, yeah, he said that. And then, and then Jesus had been speaking of his death, but the disciples thought he meant natural sleep. And then we look at, go to the verse 14, and it says that, that, well, he's dead. Girl, he gone, right? Jesus is gone. Jesus, I mean, Jesus is gone. Jesus is on his way. Lazarus is gone. Lazarus is dead, but Jesus said he wasn't going to die. But wait a minute. I, I don't understand. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there. 
That's hardcore. Jeez. I'm, I'm your boy too, Jesus. <laughs> you, I mean, you're, you're glad you weren't there? So that you may believe, but let us go to him. So we're going to go to him. And then we see this amazing thing in, in Thomas, who's, you know, doubting Thomas. We all, oh, Thomas, he's such a doubter. Um, but in this scripture, he says, let us go then to our death with him, right? He said, I want to, we're going to go because they know if they go there that the Jews that were trying to kill Jesus in the first place are going to see them coming. But if he's already dead, why are we going? <laughs> Can't we just kind of screwed around this, Jesus? There's other people that need healed and they're not dead yet. So let's get about that business. But they go. They go anyways. And then we see that Jesus meets Martha. I'm going to take up the next script. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Four days, dead, done, gone. Four days, uh, in Jewish tradition, it meant that there was, it, the soul departs the body. It's gone. There's no chance of any miracle happening. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, which is where danger was. And many Jews had come to Martha to, to Mar and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. We don't know if these are Jews that are followers of Jesus. It doesn't say many followers of Christ, many believers of, of Jesus came to support their Christian sisters. You now it says that Jews came, some of them maybe wanting to kill Jesus. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. I mean, later in the scripture, we see that she, she alerts to her to, that he's there, but if Martha knew, Mary must have known too. And, and I think Mary maybe was like, please, he's a little late. He's a little late. Put the macaroni and cheese back in the oven. He ain't getting them, right? <laughs> You missed the party, but you're not getting a plate of food. We're not going to get oil on your feet. We're not doing any of that. My brother's dead. So Martha goes out, and Martha has this amazing conversation with Jesus. She said, Lord, if you'd, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. He just, you could have saved him, God. You could have done something, Lord. Did, why didn't you come and we sent? And then Jesus says back to her, well, no, she uh, no, yeah, said to her, your brother will rise again. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask, she says. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus' response was, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Now, this is great because he says to Martha, Martha, you missed it. I mean, I appreciate the faith, right? She recognizes him as Lord. She says, anything that you say will be granted unto you. And I know he's going to be resurrected again in heaven, right? But Jesus said, no, 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 you, you think that resurrection is an event when resurrection is actually a man and I am he. You see, when you believe in me, when you, when you believe in me that you will never die, Martha. Hard to drink in, hard to believe, but we see then Mary in the next verse says, Who, uh, yeah, it's okay. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? He asked her. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. So Mary, Mary hears this. We'll go ahead and read the scripture. Mary heard this. She got up quickly and went to him. And, and now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. So she runs out, and, and the Jews had been with Mary in the house, comforting her. Notice how quickly she got up and went out. So they followed, supposing that she was going to the tomb. But instead, she goes to Jesus. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here. Why didn't you come? Did we not prove to you that we loved you? I mean, we prayed and prayed, and we were sure you were going to be here, Jesus. 
I mean, even Lazarus, you should have seen the look in his eyes. He had so much hope. Don't worry, Jesus is going to come. And I had to look him in the face and I had to close those eyes as the death, the life faded from them. And, and if you would have been here, and I love this thing. If you go into word study and, and sort of dig a little bit deeper in the Bible, you understand what the meaning of Mary is. It means rebellion. It means rebellion. Interesting, right? So, so when rebellion knelt down at Jesus' feet, when rebellion knelt down at Jesus' feet, he gave her the revelation and he said, take me to where you laid the body. And sometimes we, guys, we want so desperately to see God revealed. We want so desperately for our situation to change. And we stand here and we, we're mad at him. We're disappointed in him. Well, I guess, you know, I guess Jesus didn't answer my prayer and it's no. I guess that's what it is. We get disappointed, we get angry, we get frustrated, and we start separating ourselves from the belief of the word that he spoke. And sometimes we gotta get rid of that rebellion, that anger, that anxiety, that, that frustration, and understand that we maybe don't think the way God thinks. Maybe he thinks on a higher level. Maybe he can get it done a little bit differently than our plan originally worked out so perfectly in our view. So we need to get that rebellion out of us and we need to lay it at Jesus' feet for him to do what he said he was going to do because he can't work with people that are putting up walls who are coming to greet him because they're angry. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. And see, I always do that. I got my preacher voice. Where have you laid him, he asked. <laughs> Where if you understand the, the, the words, um, the deeply troubled thing, the, the Greek for that is, the first word is like that of an animal snarling. <clears throat> and the other one was angered. Where did you lay him? Can I put a twist on it? Where is he? And he sees them crying. In the next verse. And Jesus wept. Now, some, some people think that, they, that, that Jesus is crying because he feels so bad that Lazarus is dead. That death took him and grabbed him and took him away. And, and, but but it, it's a different kind of, of interpretation when we understand that Jesus was teed off. He wept because death whispered in his, 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 his friend's ears. The enemy had allowed him to be distracted from who Jesus was. And they're feeling pain, and I love these people. My heart breaks for you. Listen to me. But it ain't over. It's not even, it's not even listen to me. Well, Jesus, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. I was here. He's dead. I sent my word. God spoke the miracle. He wasn't done yet. He wasn't done yet. Now, let's look at the next scripture. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, ah, there were people in the crowd that questioned God's authority. They were out to get him. They said, could he not have opened the eyes of the blind man? If he opened the eyes of the blind man, could he not have kept this man from dying? I mean, do you really believe this guy? Look at him. <laughs> I see his show, but I also smell the corpse in the next room. So you can believe what you want to believe, but this dude, he let his friend die. Next verse. Jesus once more deeply moved. <laughs> you see, when you understand the right, deeply moved, he was like, really? 
Are you serious? And I love, I have to find this, this, um, uh, this, Calvin wrote this in 1959 and it's beautiful. Christ does not come to the tomb as an idle spectator, but like a wrestler preparing for a contest. Therefore, no wonder that he groans again for a violent tyranny of death, which had, he had to overcome, stands before his eyes. Remove the stones! Remove the stones! And then he goes to the father. He says, take away the stone. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, it, 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 he smells. He's been dead for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you if you believe you will see the glory of God? Didn't I tell you that? This enemy has too much hold on you. Too much. And I love that God, you know what, listen, for those doubters that were in the audience, when they removed the stones, the death filled their nostrils. Just in case. You're going to question what is about to happen here. Just in case you don't think my word is activated in the, in the death and life of this man, right? Let me fill your nostrils with some of that stink. That death that you're afraid of, taste them. So they took away the stone and Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you for what you have heard. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that it was you, God, who sent me. And when he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Now listen, again, a little kind of history and, and, and to understand what stone represents, okay, back in the day. In the biblical time, stone meant the law, right? It's the law. It was what, what was carved into the stone tablets was the law. It represents truth and law. And, 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 and what stood between Jesus and the lie of death was the law. But what they didn't know is grace snuck in before the stone pulled away. You see, when Jesus sent his word, his word didn't rest on Lazarus in the sickbed. It went ahead to the tomb and waited on the body. And some of you guys are in a sickbed and you're saying, God, why have you forgotten me? Why is that dream that you put on my heart not coming to fruition? Jesus said, listen, I sent my word. Can you wish, worship me in the middle? Will you stay faithful in the middle? Will you agree with my word and stop using those words so negatively? Will you, will you pray with my word in mind? Will you believe in the destiny that I whispered your name before you were even thought of in your parents' minds? Hmm. So he calls out. Lazarus, come out! And I love this because some theologians say that, that he had to be very specific with his words, right? Because if he didn't say Lazarus first and he said come out, the graves all over the world would be bubbling up with people because one word of the Father, come out! And, 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 and the enemy would have lost his grip, right? So he has to be specific and he says, Lazarus, come on out. Come on out. That's good. Because the next thing to happen is, whoop, Lazarus come out in the grave clothes like, what's going on? Right? Right? He's all wrapped up. Come out like, thriller. No. Um, come, he's coming out like, and, 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 and so, so you have to get this picture because I think this is so important too. Because Jesus says, take off the grave clothes and let him go. He's alive, but he isn't free. You see, I spoke resurrection over that dead thing, but he has to take off the, the belief that he's still dead before he realizes the life that I just called on him. And some of us guys are in the middle of a promise or in the middle of a dream that we think is dead, long dead and buried, and, we, and God has opened it up for us, but we're still tied up. Still wrapped up in doubt and fear and anxiety and worry, and how can I, Father, take off the grave clothes? He says, take it off. Take it off. Walk into the promise that I've given you. Walk in the authority that I have, I have, I've bestowed on you, my people, my friends. Have you lost your faith? Have you lost your hope? 
See, when Jesus spoke, and when, the, 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 the word was there waiting. When God spoke you into existence, he spoke you in destiny and purpose. It's there waiting. And you may be in a trial right now, but you got to worship God in that promise. You got to find the strength to know his character and say, God, you deserve my praise whether or not, whether or not things are good or I can pay my rent or if, if, my, if my child is sick, you deserve praise because you're God. And I know one thing that, that you say in your word is that those who believe in me will never die. What? So Lazarus is dead, but he's not dead, but he's raises them again, so what? No. He said, those of you who walk with me, those of you who understand who I am, those of you who ask me into your life, you never die. Amen. See this death thing? I'm about, this is a foreshadowing of what I'm about to do for everybody. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to take the Lazarus off and just shout. They're going to think they have me, but I'm going to go down to hell and kick Satan's bum. I'm going to kick it. And they're going to be clawing at me and fighting and screaming for you, but I'm going to kick it. Listen to me. Jesus called out and said, let go. Jesus fought for you and for you and for you, and he thought of you before you even knew, and he, and he spoke you into existence for a purpose, and he spoke promises and destinies and dreams and businesses and families and, and marriages that are healthy and, and kids that are excelling and, and all these things. He spoke these things into existence, and sometimes we can smell the death in our nose, but we have the willingness to say, God, I'm laying my rebellion down at your feet. And I give you permission, I give you permission, Father, to do what you see to do. Because I know no matter what happens, my victory has already been secured because you did the fight. And I stand in you victorious, Father. And it may not look my way, but I know that I don't die and I don't have to fear death. <laughs> I don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear death. We're victorious. Praise God. I'm going to take a drink of water here because I... A little parched. So I ask you, what do you need to loose? What do you need to take off? What grave clothes are you still holding on to? What are those things that are blocking the promise of God because you can't let go of? What are those things that we need to lay down and say, God, I trust you. Loose me, free me, Father. I ask that everybody, if you can, I'm just going to say a prayer. If you'd be willing to bow your head and close your eyes. I... Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your perfect plan. Thank you, Father, that we sit and stand and sing and celebrate in your presence in this place, God. I thank you for placing us in a, such a time as this when our nation and when our, when, our, when our world needs hope, needs joy, needs resurrection, Father. I thank you that you've placed us in a place where we can worship you without fear of death, so grateful, Father, that you consider us worthy. How crazy that is. How hard for us to grasp that you consider us worthy, that we were spoken as a love song into this creation. Thank you, Jesus.